everyone, it's Wednesday today, the 2nd of October, and I am filming today's tea time with Chloe. So this should be going up the day that I film it. And my hair is falling out already. Good start. So today's video is going to be all about my master's degree experience. And it's something that people have requested since the moment I started my master's degree. But obviously I can't really film a video about my master's degree experience until I have finished my master's degree. So I'm filming it now because last Friday I handed in my master's dissertation, 22,000 words, 65 pages and two years in the making. I handed it in and it felt so good. And I have a couple of questions. I think I did have some more questions originally, but I lost them. So I'm really sorry if I've lost your question and I don't answer it. But um, if you want to leave that in a comment below, I will definitely get back to so you. So just to start off, it would be useful to tell you what I actually studied. So I um, studied for a master's degree in history, which makes me, um, an MA, so Master of the Arts, uh, because it's like arts and humanities, I think, get lumped together. Um, so I did an MA in history and I did a taught master's, which means I actually went into university and was taught by a lecturer for certain modules. My stomach's rumbling. I'm really sorry if that comes through on the recording. But yes, I studied an MA in history um, and it was a taught master's program rather than a research master's program, which I believe you do basically on your own. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong, forgive me if I'm wrong, I didn't do a research master's, so I don't know the difference, but I know that a taught master's is where you actually go in and you are taught by somebody. I also, I feel like it's important to know that I studied part-time, so most people uh, these days go straight from university onto a master's, so they go straight from their undergraduate degree onto a master's, and most of them will complete it within a year, but I worked part-time whilst completing my master's degree, so I did it over two years, which is classed as part-time. So probably one of the first questions that um, I should answer is, how is it different overall from an undergraduate degree? And honestly, I feel that it is very different. Um, in my first module that I went to, it was mainly theoretical, so looking at sort of like different theories of history, and I honestly felt like I was not intelligent enough to be there, that I did not belong there, that I had made a huge mistake, and I almost dropped out at Christmas because I just felt that I had no idea what anyone was talking about. Um, in hindsight, I was maybe being a little bit dramatic. I do have a tendency to be a bit dramatic, but um, I really, I really didn't know what they were talking about. It was so theoretical and it was just a huge step up from my undergraduate degree. But I don't want that to put anyone off because the theoretical stuff is obviously important. You need to be able to understand it to an extent. But once you get into those um, actual uh, modules, like, oh, I can't think of the, the proper word. But for example, for me, once I got into a specific module about um, women rulers, for example, I was back in familiar territory. It was, it was stuff that I knew, it was stuff that I found much easier to research rather than all of the theoretical things. Um, so don't let those tough theoretical module, modules put you off going for a master's degree, even though they are a step up from undergrad. Um, I also felt that the workload was a lot um, harder to deal with than my undergraduate degree. Um, which is strange because I was I studied as an undergraduate full time and I studied for my master's degree part time, but I just felt that I had a lot more work, a lot more reading, and a lot more was expected of us at master's level, which is to be expected. Um, but yeah, I felt like I I spent a lot more time working than I did when I was an undergraduate, um, and there was definitely a lot more reading for each module and a lot more like homework so to speak alongside the essays that we had to complete and the essays were longer as well so um most of my modules had a 4000 word essay rather than like a 2000 word that you might have at undergrad sometimes you do have longer essays at undergrad um but pre in my previous experience it had been sort of like if you got a 4000 word essay at undergrad you'd be like wow that is a lot of words um but now that is like the bare minimum to me. Um, and also my dissertation was 20,000 words. 
for history, but I know that that's not the same everywhere and for the same for every subject. I know people who were handing in master's dissertations the same time as me and theirs only had to be 10,000 words, um, which is the same as an undergraduate degree. But yeah, mine had to be 20,000 words. Um, up to 22,000 words. So I suppose just to sum all that up, a master's degree is a lot harder than an undergrad degree, but again, I don't want that to put people off because especially if you go straight from undergrad to master's, I feel like you'll be prepared for the jump because you'll still be in that mindset of university and working. It was a lot more difficult for me, I think, because I had had two years away from university when I went back to do my master's. So it felt like coming back into totally like unfamiliar territory that I had left behind. So, eh. <laughs> sorry, I had to stop for a moment. My family were discussing something important in the family group chat and it was popping up on my phone and I had to check in and make sure everything was okay. I also received several questions about finance. So how do you finance it? How, how do you finance yourself? How do you fund a master's degree? This is gonna be different all over the place. So like if you're in the US and you're asking me that question, I have no idea how they fund master's degrees or any sort of postgraduate study in the US. But in the UK, you can actually now uh, apply for a loan. So I believe everyone is entitled to up to like 10,200 pounds or something, or that's what it was when I uh, applied. I think it increases slightly every year, but that's what it was when I applied. So everyone is entitled to a maximum of 10,000 and something pounds um, that is given to them over the course of the uh, degree. Now, that money is yours to do with as you wish. They pay you that entire amount in full. So, um, you have to be very sensible with it. Oh, it's paid to you in installments the same as your undergraduate loan, but um, you, you have to be very careful with it because if you don't have money in savings and you don't have any other way to pay for the actual degree itself, that money needs to go towards paying the tuition fees. So when you're an undergrad, the money is, uh, your maintenance loan is paid to you in installments and your tuition fees are paid directly to the university by the student loans company and you never have to worry about your tuition fees being paid. The, student's lo the student loan company is paying them for you directly to the university. However, at postgraduate level, you have to pay the university your fees. Um, so that money might come in and it looks like you've got, I don't know, £1,500 in the bank, um, but actually you need to be careful with that money because the university is going to want payment for your course. So I set up um, my payment in instalments. So every month I paid £400 uh, to my university for my course. I think I paid it uh, for four months in 2017 and four months in... Um, 2018, something along those lines, until I had paid off uh, my fees. It sounds complicated. I don't really know how else to um, describe it or explain it, but it's really not that complicated. It is explained to you um, in all the literature that you get when you join the university, um, and it was fine. Uh, the only thing I will say is that in the first year, I wasn't particularly careful with my money, so I ended up struggling to pay that £400 quite a few months, but... I got there in the end and I soon realised that I needed to save that student loan instalment when it came in so that I could pay my fees. Um, so I did study part time and I worked part time as well. That's the only way that I could manage to finance myself and also pay for like my car and everything. Somebody has said, um, so obviously that is a loan from the student loans company and somebody has said, does it work the same way as undergraduate fees in that um, the cost of your master's or postgraduate loan will just be added on to the money you already owe and yes so when I studied undergraduate it was £9,000 a year to study uh, plus my maintenance loan uh, was added on so I left university with x amount of fees that I needed to pay back which I probably never will honestly um, because you don't pay it back until you earn over a certain amount of money and I'm not earning that right now so I don't know when I'm going to start paying it back but anyway um, when you do a master's degree and you pay via this government loan that money just gets added onto your current uh, debt so I've had an extra £10,200 added onto my current debt 
plus interest. <laughs> Another person has asked what I struggled with the most and honestly, if you follow my channel and you watch my weekly vlogs, you will know that the last 18 months has been horrendous for my family. We have had a terrible time. Uh, my mum was diagnosed with breast cancer last year. Um, while she was still undergoing treatment, my brother then nearly passed away and was diagnosed with a rare endocrinological <laughs> disorder. Um, and it was actually him that we were just discussing in the group chat because he's not very well again. Um, and then once everyone was better, my Crohn's decided that it was its time to shine and I got incredibly poorly for several months and missed a lot of university. And during that time, I also moved house and it just was a lot, like a lot of things were happening. Um, so yeah. It was a tough one and honestly that was what I found most difficult trying to work around that. I think if I hadn't had all of that going on then the toughest thing would probably have been the workload um, because it is a lot but because I was studying part-time it was easier to manage even around work um, so I think if you didn't have anything else going on in your life it would just be the the workload that was the hardest thing. The next question is how did I decide between a taught masters and a research masters and like I explained in the beginning I actually don't really know what a research masters is I think it's where you basically um, do it yourself kind of thing um, but I knew I wanted to go back to the University of Winchester because it was where I did my undergrad degree and I was really happy there and it's also within commuting distance so I knew that I wanted to go back there um, it's probably different with most master's degrees, but um, my classes were in the evening. They were 6 p.m. until 9 p.m. once or twice a week. And I knew that I needed to be within commuting distance. I also felt that actually going to lectures and having supervisors and having lecturers uh, would keep me on track a little bit more because I would have to go there every week. And if I hadn't done the reading, I wouldn't know what was going on. So I just felt that that would keep me on track. But because I knew I wanted to go back to Winchester, I just looked at Winchester and their master's degree is a um, taught master's. So you actually go in for lectures and things. So that was how I decided it was super easy. That was what they were offering. So I just did that. How did I decide on a dissertation topic and approach the research and writing? So for me, the dissertation topic was actually really hard. And I remember at undergraduate feeling the same way. I just was like, I don't know what to study. And a lot of people do really specific things. So there was somebody on my course looking at like specifically one queen's household records and like how much money she sp uh, spent and stuff and I just I don't know that just doesn't necessarily appeal to me um I've always really enjoyed history within popular culture so how people in the present day consume history how do people learn about historical figures without going to university and doing a history degree um most people learn about historical figures and historical events from popular culture. So films and television and novels, um, that sort of thing. Documentaries on the BBC. And interestingly, a lot of that stuff is not actually accurate. Um, and that really interests me. A lot of people feel they know a lot about a topic because they've watched a lot of documentaries or they've read a lot of historical novels, but actually a lot of it is not accurate. So I wanted, I knew I wanted to study that. And you're meant to try and bring something new to the field. Um, and obviously I ended up studying Henry VIII's wives, which is an oversaturated market. The Tudors are popular within popular culture and within historiography. So like academic histori historiographical debate. Um, it's a saturated area, but there was a brand new musical that came out in 2017 that became sort of really famous in 2018 and, and this year called Six, about Henry's six wives. And it's sort of like a feminist reimagining of them. And I was really inspired by that musical to study Henry VIII's wives. I've always loved the Tudors. Um, and I just wanted to sort of unpick some of the stereotypes that uh, plague the portrayals of these women really, because, you know, Anne Boleyn is always the um, sexually promiscuous, um, schema, you know, she schemed to break up Henry VIII's marriage to Catherine of Aragon. Um, and Catherine of Aragon is the boring Spanish religious one. Um, so I wanted to sort of unpick a lot of that and see where these stereotypes came from. 
so that was how I decided. I It was sort of in stages. I knew I kind of wanted to look at popular culture. Then I was kind of inspired by Six the Musical, which was obviously about Henry VIII's wives. So that's what I ended up looking at. Um, and in terms of how I approached the research and the writing, mm, I didn't approach it particularly well, to be honest. I was behind schedule the whole way, really. Um, but that was obviously mainly due to everything that had been going on in my life at the time. Um, but the best way to approach such a large piece of writing is to break it down into your chapters and ask yourself what you want each chapter to actually achieve. And then treat each chapter as its own sort of separate entity that connects and flows between the other chapters. So what I did was I researched each chapter almost separately because I had one chapter about um, academic historiographical debate. I had one chapter about film and television. I had one chapter about Six the Musical. So I sort of researched them all separately, compared all of my ideas um, and all of my notes um, to make like a cohesive plan and cohesive argument. And then I wrote each chapter separately. And I would suggest that you leave your introduction and conclusion until last as well. Um, but I wrote each chapter separately. And then I went back through them and I edited it and I added in references to the other chapters so that they would all flow and be connected. And I think it worked. I mean, I don't know my grade, but my lecturer seemed pretty happy with it. So we'll see. The next question is what would I do differently? And I don't really know what I would do differently. I would probably start my research a lot earlier than I did for my dissertation. Um, but like I said, I was mainly scuppered because of everything that happened afterwards. Um, so I couldn't really have known that. But with hindsight, I would start my research a lot earlier. Um, and the last question is, what was the highlight of your course? And honestly, the highlight was seeing my dissertation printed and bound and ready to hand in. There is just, it's like, you know, something you've slaved over for two years and finally it's done and you can hand it in and not have that pressure on you anymore. And it was amazing to hand it in. It all happened very quickly and it was a bit anticlimactic, but afterwards I was like, yes, I did it. Um, and... I handed it in with my mum as well, so it was really nice to have her there to like celebrate my achievement. Um, and also another highlight was I actually had to give a presentation at a conference. I know, terrifying, but that was almost a highlight as well, being able to do that, because I was really poorly at the time. Being able to go there and do it and achieve it and get a good grade and actually just complete that module was also a massive highlight for me, so... Yeah. Honestly, just being able to complete this whole degree and get my dissertation handed in on time and know that it's complete is just the biggest highlight. Um, but yeah, so I know that was like a rambly video, but my tea time with Chloe videos are rambly. I also feel like I look very tired. And again, that's because I am. My stomach has rumbled the whole way through this. So I need to go and get some food, I think, and get some energy. Um, but yeah, if you do have any questions that I haven't answered, then please just leave them in the comments and I will get back to you. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it gave you some sort of insight into what it's like to do a master's degree. And uh, yeah, I will see you in my next video. Bye, guys.